11 o'clock, so we should probably get started. The last class after all of this. The ninth in a series. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, there were seven seals, seven trumpets, seven signs, seven bulls, seven sights. There should have been only seven classes, but there, there were nine. <laughs> so unveiling empire, reading Revelation today. So that's the main topic, but I have some old business from last time. I ran out of time before I got to talk about a couple of things. Oh, so I want to start today talking about two things you know about Revelation that are wrong. So here's, here's two uh, misunderstandings about Revelation. The rapture, it's not in Revelation. That's not where they get the idea of a rapture. So where does it come from? The rapture, you probably understand is where believers are taken up from the earth to who knows where. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert in this rapture thing because Lutherans don't believe in it, but the believers are supposedly taken up from earth and will escape what is sometimes called the Great Tribulation. Uh, if you were uh, in church, Kyler mentioned that in, in his uh, sermon. Supposedly, there was a movie about it. it, came out in 1972, and then the whole Left Behind series of books. Uh, I don't know, I never read Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth, that book, but uh, it may have, have appeared in that book too. I'm not sure. UFOs? Yeah, yeah yes, <laughs> UFOs, people, people taken up. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's where that idea came from, I don't know. Anyway. So, where does that come from? A couple of places I've identified in the Bible that you could uh, interpret to mean uh, a rapture. One is from Matthew chapter 24. We've heard a lot about uh, from Matthew 24 and 25 these days. It's, uh, it's an apocalyptic uh, part of, of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. We don't normally think of the Gospels as uh, being apocalyptic, but uh, these two chapters in Matthew are. Um, and it's uh, Jesus talking to his disciples. I'll mention a little bit more about that in a bit. But here are two verses that you could interpret as uh, referring to, the, to a rapture. Let me uh, read this text, just two verses. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Well, yeah, I can see why people would interpret that to be a rapture. It doesn't, it doesn't say where they will be taken, but you could, I guess you could interpret that to be a rapture. Um, the point of the text, what Jesus is talking about here is how suddenly the end will come. You know, like a, the, the, the phrase goes, like a thief in the night. You're going to be very surprised. Uh, this whole section, these two chapters, are what is sometimes called the Olivet Discourse uh, by, by scholars. Uh, Jesus and the disciples are on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples say, ask Jesus, uh, wh when is this going to happen, and, 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 and how are we going to know? What are the signs? I'm not going to read the, all of these two chapters. It's too long, but I want to read part of it so you get the idea of where this is coming from. As Jesus came out of the temple and was going away, his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Then he asked them, you see all these, do you not? Truly, I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered them, 
Beware that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will lead many astray, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all of this is but the beginning of the birth pangs. They will hand you over to be tortured and will put you to death and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And many will fall away and they will betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold and one who endures to the end will be saved. So, I mean, it's apocalyptic language goes on for two chapters. Um, and. Uh, that's where those, those two verses about one will be taken and one will be left come, come out of this uh, apocalyptic sec section of Matthew. Um, uh, because of all of these uh, woes that Jesus is talking about at the end times, uh, this, um, this is sometimes called the great tribulation that's going to happen at the end. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute. So, apocalyptic language. Um, we as progressive Christians tend to interpret apocalyptic language symbolically rather than literally. Okay. Now, many uh, conservative evangelicals, fundamentalists, uh, Pentecostal Christians interpret these things literally as something that is 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 going to happen exactly this way, and they call this the the tribulation, and insert that into a, a timeline that they have of what the end of the world is going to look like. This is one of the source texts for uh, the so the so-called tribulation, and it goes into a belief called millennialism. And I showed a diagram for this last time, and I'm, I'm going to repeat this because this was very confusing, and I don't blame you if you just got totally overwhelmed last time, so I'm, I'm just going to uh, put this up again. Um, one interpretation, now that you know a little bit more about that tribulation and where that comes from, uh, about that, uh, from that Olivet Discourse you know, from Matthew, the uh, 24 and 25, uh, the, there's... Um, several interpretations of what this millennial, the, the millennium will look like. Uh, Post-tribulational premillennialism. Uh, premillennialism means the second coming will be before the millennium. The millennium is the thousand-year reign of Christ. That's a literal interpretation of Revelation chapter 20. Second coming, if the second coming is before the millennium, that's called premillennialism. If the second coming is before the tr Great Tribulation, that's post-tribulational premillennialism. Okay? <laughs> yeah, I know, it's, it's, it's complicated. But that's what, that, that's what this is. The, the, cry, the, the cross on the left, that's when Christ was on earth the first time. Then the tribulation, the second coming, the millennium, the, millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ, and then the last judgment. That's one belief. Then there's another kind of premillennialism in which the second coming is before the tribulation, at least the first second coming, which is the rapture. Christ comes and raptures the believers who avoid the tribulation. And then the second coming, the second second coming before the millennium and then the last judgment. This is called pre-tribulational premillennialism or sometimes dispensational premillennialism because people have more than one chance to be saved in this timeline. Uh, the believers are raptured before the tribulation and then during the tribulation and the millennium, uh, uh, people have, an, have a chance to repent during this time and they can be saved at the last judgment. So you, you have another chance during this time. Now, as I said, this belief in the rapture 
is mainly among, among conservative evangelicals, fundamentalists, and, and Pentecostal Christians. Uh, Lutherans don't tend to go along with this. In fact, uh, Lutherans and, and Catholics and Episcopalians and other mainline Protestant denominations don't buy into this. In fact, uh, the last pope, Pope Benedict XVI, published a, a scathing rebuke of millennialism. So Catholics don't go along with this, this kind of thing either. Yeah, no, 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 please don't. Uh, so another kind of millennialism, which I don't think is very common, is post-millennialism, in which the second coming is after the millennial, millennium. In this, in this point of view, Christ rules from heaven here during the thousand years, and then the second coming and last judgment uh, happens after the reign of Christ from heaven. Now we get to what we believe, which is most simply described as Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. That, that's the simplest, that's what Catholics, Episcopalians, and most uh, mainline Protestant denominations believe. And here you see uh, what's labeled as a symbolic millennium. We don't t tend to use the word millennium at all because that means a thousand years. And we believe that thousand years is symbolic. And so we use, tend to use terms like the messianic, uh, the messianic age. You know, Christ came to, uh, in, in uh, mission on earth. 2,000 years ago and died and rose and ascended into heaven and now we are in the messianic age like Kyler if you heard Kyler's sermon we're in the messianic age right now and that's going to last for who knows how long it's been 2,000 years already and we don't know how much longer it's going to last but eventually Christ will come again and there will be a last judgment and that's that's about it. We're, we're, we're very simple people compared to, <laughs> compared to you know, those other uh, ideas. Uh, the other, um, there are other places in the Bible that, where you might get the idea that there's going to be a rapture, and one of them is 1 Thessalonians. I think we heard from 1 Thessalonians uh, at, uh, in another reading. But this is a different passage from 1 Thessalonians. Uh, Paul writes, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died. Uh, see, <clears throat> there, as, as time went on back then, people were starting to wonder, well, uh, our, our, our relatives and friends are dying off and Christ hasn't come yet. What about those who have died? What's going to happen to them when Christ comes? Are, are they just gonna miss out? And so Paul writes, um, about those who have died, so you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So caught up in the air, could you could imagine that to be a rapture, right? Um, I don't think that's what Paul had in mind, however. So this, the point is to reassure those whose loved ones had passed away that those who had died are not going to miss out. Uh, the language that Paul is using here to meet the Lord in the air is a uh, language that was used to form a delegation to meet a ruler. When, uh, when, a, when a king came with a procession to visit a city in his territory, the people in the city would keep careful watch to watch for the procession. And when the king's procession, when they sighted it coming close to the city, all the people of the city would rush out to meet the procession 
and escort the king's procession back into the city. The people weren't going to leave their city. They were escorting the procession back into the city, right? And that's the language that Paul is using here. The, the, the people caught up in the air are not leaving the earth. They're escorting their king back to the earth, right? Coming home to earth. See, like Revelation said, uh, see, the, um, the, the, the king and the lamb, uh, will, their home will be with mortals, as it says in Revelation. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we, we tend to, to read these apocalyptic passages symbolically uh, rather than literally like, like some Christians do. Okay, that's about any question, many more questions about the rapture. We, we tend to not to, to take those things literally. The Antichrist, also not in Revelation. If you read Revelation carefully, the word Antichrist is not there. It comes from someplace else. Where does it come from? First John and Second John. Now, to be sure, the second beast in Revelation, the beast from the earth, the one whose number is 666, that beast would be an example of an antichrist, but the word antichrist is not connected with, in Revelation with that beast. First John, two places in First John. Uh, children, it is the last hour, as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by going out, they made it plain that none of them belongs to us. See, these are secessionists people who split off because they changed their beliefs. They did no longer have the same beliefs as the original group of uh, disciples did. And again, and every spirit that is, does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming and is now it is already in the world. So there are, these are, are, are um, prophets that had split off, and first, the author of 1 John says these are, these are agents, they have become agents of the evil one because they no longer preach the true word. Uh, they, they preach something different and are now what this author says are antichrists, false prophets, spreading a false message. And in Revelation, that second beast is sometimes referred to as a false prophet, and so for sure, uh, that beast uh, could be referred to as an example of an antichrist. Uh, but they are false prophets. Going back to Matthew 24 again, for example, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and produce great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So here's another example in that uh, Olivet Discourse where Jesus warns of, you could say, uh, more examples of antichrists. Second John also refers to antichrists. Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Such, any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. So, there were some that says Jesus Christ, see, first and second John were written, well, I don't know, probably almost 100 years after Christ was actually in the flesh. So it had been a long time. There had developed beliefs that had split apart from the true Christian beliefs. And some of them were that, well, Christ didn't 
really come in a real human body. Uh, 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 Christ was only appeared to be human. That belief, that was a heresy called docetism, that uh, Christ just appeared to be human. It was just a, these early Christians just had visions of a human being. Uh, and, and so I think that's what the author of Second John is referring to here, that, the, uh, that, that Jesus was, didn't have real flesh and blood. It was, just seemed to be so. So any such person is a, the deceiver and the antichrist. That's where antichrist comes from. It, that word appears only in First John and Second John, uh, nowhere in Revelation. So, any questions about? Do you know what the, the Greek word that was used in the original text? I didn't look it up, and I don't have my Greek New Testament with me, so I'm okay. sorry, can't, can't. Just, just wondering how, how much is lost in translation. Yeah, I'm, if I had to guess, I'm pretty sure it's, it, Antichrist is a literal translation of the Greek, but no, I don't offhand, I don't know what the word is. Larry. Was Armageddon? Yes, Armageddon. Yeah, in fact, uh, it's uh, the the actual Greek pronunciation is Harmageddon in in Revelation. It's um, it's uh, the there's a the 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 alpha that begins the uh, word Harmageddon has a diacritical mark on it that uh, in Greek there's a diacritical mark that indicates rough breathing so it's Harmageddon in Greek it comes from the Hebrew Harmageddon that means Mount Megiddo which is an actual place in Israel uh, it's uh, to the northwest of the West Bank. And it was a place that uh, it, uh, trade routes went through there, and so there were a lot of battles fought. Nations tried to trying to control those trade routes. So, you know, for John, who wanted to come up with a place that would be, uh, you know, a, a place of uh, of a great battle at the end of the age, it would it was a good choice, you know, for for a major battle among all nations. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, Armageddon was a real place. Anything else? Another thing I want to do before we get into a discussion is a, uh, a recap or a uh, takeaways. Oh yeah, I'm fin just to finish up here, those who deny that Christ has come in the flesh. Okay, takeaways. So, just in summary, uh, what you can take away from our study of Revelation. Written by John in exile on the island of Patmos to seven churches in Asia Minor. Uh, the purpose was to give hope to those under oppression by the Roman Empire. To John, the end of the Roman Empire equaled the end of the world. The Roman Empire was the world to John. It was probably impossible for him to imagine the end of Roman oppression without the end of the world. That was, they were, the two were so linked together in John's mind that when he was writing the story, this, this oppression was, was going to end. The Roman Empire was going to end for these people. That had to mean the end of the world. Now, of course, we know from looking back in history the Roman Empire did end, but the world didn't. Still, there are some Christians today that hold on to the idea that Revelation is a blueprint for the end of the world. Uh, even though this equation is broken, they still hold on to the right-hand side of it. Although we don't, we don't interpret Revelation literally, uh, some Christians do. We maintain that the book of Revelation is apocalyptic, not prophetic. And we interpret apocalyptic literature 
in terms of symbols and metaphors, not literally. Uh, so we have our disagreements with the people that take it uh, literally. Okay, now does that mean that Revelation isn't worth reading anymore? If, if it was about the fall of the Roman Empire, why do we read it? Well, the Roman Empire has come and gone, but think about oppressive human governments, institution, and, and organizations. Human, human institutions that take advantage of the poor, the weak, the marginalized. Well, history's full of those, and they exist today. Can't Revelation give hope to those people who are being taken advantage of by human organizations today? Can't we offer some hope and say, you know, God's on your side here. Look, it says so right here. God's on your side. And furthermore, as Kyler says in, said in his sermon, God has been working to that end all along. And as Christians, God's work our hands, as it says, the ELCA motto, right? We're here to help. So I, Revelation is every bit as relevant today as it ever was because it describes the work of God and therefore the work of Christians like us. That's what I think the takeaway is of Revelation today. Okay? My opinion, of course. Okay, so are we ready to get into some discussion? Here's, I came up with some discussion questions here. Of course, I'm not gonna limit your discussion. You can talk about anything you want. What I'm gonna want to do is have, have, have discussions at your tables for 15 minutes or so, and then, and then we'll come back and uh, discuss together as a large group first. What did you learn about the book of Revelation that surprised you? Was there anything surprising here? What did you learn? This is more for personal curiosity than anything else, I guess. I, I hope the answer was, uh, well, I didn't learn anything. I, I, hope you, I hope you've learned something. Second, John wrote to seven churches in Asia Minor offering praises, reproaches, and promises. If you wrote a similar letter to St. Andrew, what would you write? <laughs> yes, I heard about the Horizon team from my wife. <laughs> and uh, past, Pastor Moe's uh, exercise. Second question, what would you say are the evil empires of today? And as I mentioned, uh, don't limit yourself to governments. I mean, it's easy to say, well, Russia is an evil empire. Well, don't limit yourself. There are many other institutions, organizations, and social structures, like, um, you know, institutional racism, for example. What can we do to help the oppressed? As I said, God is not going to let, let that stay. I mean, if we believe the metaphorical interpretation of revelation, God's not going to let that stuff stand, right? And God's work our hands, what are we supposed to be doing? Okay, so those are the discussion questions I came up with. Uh, think about that for a bit and let's get some table discussions going and then we'll um, come back together in about 10 or 15 minutes and discuss as a large group.
I think it's probably time to gather back together as a large group. Sounded like there were some good discussions going on. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, if you could. Let's see, is that on yet? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, can't, you're going to have to hold it close. I don't know, it's going to whack it around a while. Try it again. Yes, I think it's, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you have to hold it a little close, but it works. Okay, so. All right. <coughs> so, let's start with, um, what did you learn, if anything? What, did it, did it surprise you, the class? I've read Revelation through twice from beginning to end, and it totally surprised me to learn that it really wasn't uh, or isn't meant to be a uh, portent of what's to come, that it's yeah. more uh, pro apocalyptic than prophetic. Yeah. That was really a big surprise to me. Yeah, yeah. At least according to Lutherans or, you know, and, and uh, most mainline Protestant denominations, it's not intended to be a literal depiction of the end of the world, yeah. It's kind of appropriate that it's the last book of the Bible when it brings so much of the Old Testament into the New Testament and kind of, anyway. I just said that that was one of the things we discussed as well as the um, kind of, so much of it was based on the, the, New, the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, John either had a, um, had a Bible with him, or he had a very good memory, didn't he? <laughs> There's, <laughs> yeah, a lot of Old Testament. I, I, I kind of wanted to make the point that the book of Revelation is not, it, it isn't really out there apart from the rest of the biblical tradition. It's, 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 a, it's an integral part of the biblical tradition, and uh, there's a lot of Old Testament, and, and, and even New Testament in, in it. Yeah, thank you. Anything else about that question? Okay, let's go on. So if you had to write a letter to St. Andrew Lutheran Church, what praises, reproaches, and promises would you put in there? It's too hard, <laughs> too tough, too tough. Yeah. We, d we did, as part of the Horizon process, we all did. Yeah. So it, as I recall, the, the basic themes of what most people wrote the praises were praises for taking such good care of this um, area of our wetlands and and everything and our earth care um, efforts and praises for our efforts to bring people together and to stay faithful to the gospel um, reproaches were things like you could do better um, <laughs> the, you know there are i don't remember the specific reproaches but we had some things you know we can work on we always have to work on it. Mm -hmm. And promises um, sort of ran the gamut of, if you keep faithful to what I ask you to do, it'll be fine. You'll be fine. So yeah, different versions of that. Yeah, and, and John didn't have items from all three categories for 
all of the churches either. So right. if you're if you had to leave one out, that's I guess that's okay. <laughs> all right, should we go to the third? The third one I think is the most interesting of the three questions. What would you say are the evil empires of today? And let's um, just to um, just to introduce this, the the book one of the books I used for a reference to prepare for this class was um, uh, Unveiling Empire. Uh, the uh, two authors of that book, the, the, the book was written almost 25 years ago, and it was their opinion that the evil empire of today, or rather 25 years ago, was global capital. And the enticement of global capital is consumerism, encouraging people to accumulate more and more things. That was their idea of the e evil empire of the day. Uh, so, but uh, what do you think? Well, I think of people in government that are uh, promoting the taking away of books, taking away the uh, rights of individuals, uh, and trying to impose uh, their theology or whatever you want to call it upon others. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I call that anti-wokeism. <laughs> anti-wokeism anti-wokeism that's good anybody well, else? we've been hearing the last couple of weeks about how we're supposed to stay awake right that's what the readings say so <laughs> anti-woke doesn't sound like it's what we should be doing that's right that's right It's Church of Scientology um, and the differences in of their leadership and where they were, are going. And it just seems so, um, it's, it's all about them and no one else mm. means anything. Mm. Um, I was talking to Bill about another organization down in California. I um, can't remember the name, but it's a, a political par, uh, organization and it's the security on it is terrific i mean not everybody can get in there and it, it involves um, our local um, leaders the presidents um, movie stars certain people Money is, the, I think, the key of the whole thing. Uh -huh. um, and yeah. then another organization that I brought up was um, the, the Lutheran Church in Vancouver. It's Apostolic Lutheran Church. Apostolic uh -huh. Lutheran Church. It is totally different. And to have a Lutheran word on there, I mean, it is extremely different, and it's way out from anything we hear would even consider. Yeah, interesting. Um, it's right out outside of Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, they have their own businesses, um, and the people within it, uh, they have to be, they have to work for the company. You're not outside that. The kids have their own school. It is, it is very much that way, but to carry the Lutheran name bothers me. Um, hmm. So, those are some of the ones that we were talking about. Yeah. One thing that seemed universal in a lot of these groups is the need for control. Wanting to stuff everybody, including God, into a predetermined box. The smaller the better, and that they have control of what the definition is. And I think it's based on fear, that they fear not having control. 
And so it just grows. And they scare other people who then build their definitions. And um, yeah. Any other ideas about uh, evil empire today? Well, we talked about the um, colonization of North America, and it happened all over the world. It happened in Australia, New Zealand, Africa, yeah. Oh, yeah. but where infants were scooped up and removed from their families at birth. I, I know a woman who in 19, it was about 1960, she's a little younger than I am, she was taken from her mother at birth at the hospital and placed in a white family with the idea that they were, they were saving her soul because she was going to be pagan. And so, but that happened all over as late as, you know, the 1970s, this was still going on. So, and it's all about that colonization mentality that anybody who is not white European is not really human. And therefore, whatever they have, I'm entitled to. So I, I think that's yeah. the source of a lot of evil. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, till yeah. It, 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 it was a it was a concerted effort in North America and also in Africa, to you got to kill the savage and save the child. And so they couldn't know anything about their culture. They couldn't know their language. They couldn't. Um, it, I mean, it was horrible. It was horrible. Then they sent them away to boarding school. I mean, it's just, the whole thing was just awful. Just awful. Yeah. And what that does, of course, is it traumatizes a whole, many generations. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll, um, we're just about out of time, but I'll bring up another evil empire, that, that what I think is an evil empire. If you think about our society and the rampant uh, drug addiction in our society, think about there must be organizations that are making billions of dollars addicting people. That, uh, that, that's, you know, what a terrible scourge on society uh, that these people are making, stuffing their pockets with money on the, bank, uh, on the backs of, of people who are becoming addicted to these drugs. Uh, to me, that's an evil empire. So is there a word of hope in here somewhere? <laughs> oh, um, so, so let's, yeah, I can't end on that. So this, this last point, what can we do to help the oppressed? According to Revelation, I mean, even reading it metaphorically, God does not let things like that stand. I mean, if you, I mean, if you believe Revelation, even metaphorically, God's not going to let that stand. So God's work, our hands, what are we supposed to do about it? These evil empires. Did anybody talk about that? I would say set the, set the example. Mm -hmm. Set the example? Set, set the example. Vote. 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 That's a good one. Vote. Speak out. Speak out. We can do the things that we can do to help the oppressed, like Lutheran World Relief and Lutheran and, World Relief, yeah, that's and right. And all the other the, the Thanksgiving gift cards, the Barnes Giving Tree, the, yes. everything that's that we do, we can is helping the oppressed, and yeah. we can continue to do these things. Yeah. Society. No, I think you all heard that. But, but there's so many, so many um, negative hate um, yeah. activities going on now that. Yeah. I, I know. I know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Why can't we? You know, I remember this song in the 70s. It was all we are saying, Lord, is give peace a chance. Yeah, right. You know? Right. 
I think if we gave peace a chance, we'd all find out we like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, is there anything else before we call it a day? Thank you all for coming to this series of classes. Thank you.